happen too. All right. Okay. We okay. Well, we can record the discussion um, as well and pause it if we need to. But in the meantime, welcome um, to uh, a session that we have organised with with Les Levado. Thank you very much, Les, for for being uh, with us. This is actually normally just a session for my students uh, on the uh, the module Political Ecology of Development. We have a kind of open slot because we can't all get together and hang out physically. Uh, so we have a kind of open slot to sort of a space where we can we can do other stuff and interact in other ways and and some of that's uh, around just our own core stuff but some of it's around opening up and just taking advantage of things that are happening around us and uh, uh, <laughs> and a conversation between myself and some colleagues uh, and les led to this seminar being set up and i'm very grateful to les for for making the time to come and talk to us um, Les uh, is at the uh, the Open University, uh, and he's going to be talking to us today um, about the ways in which uh, traditional communities uh, in uh, Brazil are um, <clears throat> mobilizing um, particular elements of culture around agri-food and musical elements of culture for a kind of territorialized development. Les is going to tell us all about what that means and how it is encapsulated in the phrase to conserve is to resist or preservar e resistir. Is that right? Is that what it would be in, yes. por in, Portu in Brazilian Portuguese? Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I'm not murdering that too much. Is the, but um, Les, uh, I think without further ado, I will really sort of hand it over to you to, to hear about this fascinating way of mobilizing through um, conservation as a sort of umbrella space, if you like, or a holding space for all kinds of interesting sort of um, uh, cultural facets around agri-food and, and, and musical dynamics. So over to you, Les. Hello, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for joining us. So here's the title, Conservers to Resist, which comes from the communities which are the focus of the talk. And I'll explain the other terms as we go along. So next, you know, thanks to Andrew for dealing with the PowerPoint slide, so I can focus on what I'm saying. So this comes from our research project, short name, AgroEcos, and you see the little symbol after the Ecos, and the next slide explains why. Uh, and the next slide. Yeah, so the full title, official title, Agroecology-Based Solidarity Economy in Bolivia and Brazil, funded by the GCRF program led by the OU, me, me, me. So after the project started, we had a long discussion about a short, catchy title and hit upon agroecos, meaning that these solidaristic agroecological practices echo across time and space, thus being widely replicated. This talk will give a retrospective view from before the COVID-19 crisis, I mean, from, from almost before the project began, in one of the case study areas called the Bocaina on the northern coast between Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro. It has uh, many origins. Back in 2017, our main partner in Brazil, UNESPE, State University of Sao Paulo, organized a visit there, eventually leading to our current project. And then last autumn, a different unit at the OU organized a mini conference called Eco Creativity, which was the spur for me to connect what I'd already was studying with the musical cultures. And that also connected with my own personal history of singing, learning songs from many parts of the world over about four decades. And we'll come back to that at the end of the discussion. So, next slide. Yeah, so as the general context in Brazil, there's the concept comunidades tradicionais. In many coastal areas, especially, diverse traditional communities have gained livelihoods from resource light activities for centuries. And of course, some of them of the indigenous people before the Portuguese colonizers and then other communities since then. 
But these communities increasingly lack security of land tenure or security of access to local resources. All this has been jeopardized by several changes, real estate development or just speculation, you know, land grabbing with a view towards future financial gain, predatory tourism, and capital intensive agriculture. The, the, the concept traditional communities highlights their communal use and sustainable management of natural resources. And th this concept was embedded into a new policy framework in 2005 as, a, as a, an agenda to help protect those communities. The, the term traditional can be pejorative, for example, meaning backwards, resisting progress. Yet the term has come to incorporate new collective identities stimulated by territorial conflicts and regular mobilizations to defend land rights. And that will be illustrated by this case study in the Bokaina subregion, the same name as a national park, which includes three coastal towns, as you'll see on the next slide, the map. The Big Red area is one of the national parks as a protected area. More on that later. And then in the middle, you see Parati, one of the towns. And then on the left, Ubatuba, on the way to Santos and then Sao Paulo. And then on the right, Angra dos Reis, on the way to Rio de Janeiro. So those three towns comprise the, the network which is the focus of the study here. Um, next slide. So the Forum de Comunidades Tradicionais, FCT, was established in 2006. It has built unity among the three traditional communities, namely indigenous Guarani, the Colombolas, who are descendants of escaped slaves, and Caisares, descendants of Portuguese settlers who remained in the remote coastal areas. And I'll explain more about each of those groups when we come to them in turn. So the FCT promoted intercommunity solidarity through cooperative initiatives to protect natural resources, to develop an agroecological form of agroforestry, and to build community based tourism, and thereby to oppose various threats while providing more secure incomes for the people. As a general motto, which was launched formally in 2014, to conserve is to resist. The next slide, you'll see that on their logo, preservar e resistir in defense of the traditional territories. And the logo you see symbolizes the unity of the three communities with the agroecological agroforestry and fishing, artisanal fishing. So next slide. Now they all continue and elaborate their musical cultures, strongly grounded in dance. These cultures have been shared at public festivals, in education programs, in at political protests, and FCT events. So we'll just look briefly at the 10th anniversary celebration in 2016, which features, at least briefly, you know, each of those cultures. So we move to the YouTube film. At the beginning, you'll see the Yongo, the Kilimbolas, and then briefly, you'll see the uh, Kaisaris playing Fandango, but you won't hear it. Everybody is going to be young though. Now we come up in all places.
tradicionais. Esse é um movimento que reúne indígenas, caiçaras e quilombolas aqui do nosso território. De Angra, Paraty e Ubatuba. Sorry, that's how much do you want on this video? Yeah, just to move it along now. I think it was three minutes, 40 seconds. It's this one's four minutes, 48. Do you want to see? Oh, 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 three, three minutes, 40 seconds. So this one says one minute, three of four minutes, 48. Yeah, yeah just, you keep Is going. There a, should I just keep going? Okay, sure, sorry. Yeah, move it along now. Essa organização que se chama Fórum das Comunidades. Yeah, that's it. Gente, a gente vai estar sozinho, a gente está em países de outras caixaras indígenas e angolas. Enquanto a gente estiver aqui, vai ter luta. Qualquer coisa que vai luta. Isso é importante dizer. Todos juntos somos fortes. Somos flecha e somos arco. Todos nós no mesmo barco. Ninguém valorizava a sua cultura, ninguém valorizava o seu modo de vida. E o fórum veio para fortalecer isso. Fala, não, a sua cultura ela é, é, ela tem valor, é valorizada para você, para nós. Mundo. Nós não aterramos manguezal, né? nós não privatizamos praia, nós não botamos esse território para ninguém. Esse território nós nós vamos cuidar sim. E é isso, é a luta do fórum. Sorry, I couldn't hear you there. I was also getting really interested in what they were saying. So, uh, uh, are we are we going back to the slides now, Les? Yeah, I think uh, the next one. It's seen the next slide. Okay, uh, just a second. <laughs> Share a different screen now. Um, Aga. Their their musical okay. cultures. Yeah. So, shall I move on, Les? Yes. Yeah. Next slide. Okay. Yeah, and that, that's the uh, the coordinator who you saw speaking before, but now you can read what he said in English. But in fact, actually, that was in a newspaper interview. It is not easy to bring together the three groups, given their different cultures, but we are taking important steps. He's being perhaps unduly modest about their achievements. Yeah, next. So I've taken as a research question here, I mean, likewise for the talk I gave last November, how do the three communities link their agri-food and musical cultures in old and new forms? How do they mobilize such cultures to defend their territory, to resist the dominant development model, and to create alternatives? So move on. So as I mentioned before, you know, for several centuries, such communities continued their traditional lives, featuring light forms of agroforestry, fishing, and crafts, which were later called artisanal, to distinguish them from industrialized forms of production. And fortunately for them, the area had difficult access from the, the large cities, which weren't very far away. But the major change came in the 1970s with the Rio Santos motorway, Rio to the east and Santos to the west on the way to Sao Paulo. So this meant that people from those major cities could reach the area much more quickly and that then uh, facilitated what are called modernization agendas such as urbanization and civil construction associated with predatory tourism and second homes where people would stay for part of the year so the, the land conflicts had existed for a long time but new financial incentives for so-called development, you know, sharpen those conflicts. 
and then the, the especially the real estate developers got armed men to threaten or use violence to expel many residents and kept everyone under continuous insecurity. I mean, now that many of them were deprived of access to land or to natural resources, many residents found low paid and secure work in larger towns to earn a living. Others sought to remain on the land and to try to gain livelihoods there despite the obstacles. So next slide. Now, given the great environmental degradation of this uh, modernization agenda, there were calls to limit that harm. So the government eventually established unidades de conservação, conservation areas. So that helped, but these areas often overlapped with the lands that were the residential areas, or at least the uh, natural resources needed by the traditional communities. So this environmental colonization was based on the so-called you know, myth of untouched nature, you know, prevalent among conservation groups then and even to some extent now. So this myth you know, denies the everyday conservation by communities which were using the natural resources. So the FCT contested this policy, you know, including that myth, and eventually gained a multi-actor shared management of the conservation areas, shared meaning among them, state bodies and civil society groups. And then they went on to develop agroforestry systems, which link nature conservations, income from the products, and the community's traditional ways of life. This All this was done through a partnership with civil society networks, you know, especially coordinated by the Observatorio de Territorio Sustentable Ivish, the South Ivish, uh, the Observatory of Sustainable and Healthy Communities, or the Territories, sorry, OTSS. For now on, I'll just call it the Observatory. So move on. So they hosted events under the general theme Agroecology Cultivating Territories or Being Viver. This is the well known Andean indigenous concept which means something more profound than simply living well. It's about you know, living in a harmonious way with nature and fellow humans. The, the FCT promoted the concept socio-environmental justice you know, as a iteration of the well-known concept already, environmental justice. They developed a communitarian model which turned each place or site into a symbol of group identity and collective heritage. They developed a cooperative forms of organization which extended a mutual aid tradition known as mutirao or mutirarish in the plural form and I'll explain more later. As a major problem, I mean there was an individualistic extraction of natural resources which degraded them so in response, stronger community bonds could better deter such behavior by offering alternatives. More on that later. So move on. Next slide. For the agroforestry, they developed a community nursery for new forest plants. And this in turn became a basis for distinctive foods, sometimes called non-conventional food plants. These were eventually showcased by a new Turismo de Base Comunitario, community-based tourism. This expanded short food supply chains for a solidarity economy by various means, such as travel guides to attract tourists who really wanted to know more about these practices, restaurants and festivals. The TBC initiatives formed a network with the name Nandereco, a Guarani, Guarani concept meaning we share our way of being with visitors. So this sh shared experiences among various localities of the tradition of communities themselves in order to strengthen their own internal democracy, their income generation and resistance against the kind of threats I mentioned before. So move on, next slide. And the FCT hosted a regional wide 
conference of all the initiatives in community-based tourism. Yeah. Next slide. And this is, uh, just illustrates this, the storytelling by the griot, you know, the wise elders. Of course, that's uh, an African term still used in places such as Mali. So, next slide. And another key demand was for an ethnically differentiated education in the state schools. And after several years of these demands, the partnership between the FCC and the observatorio began to win such demands from the local authorities. Schools began a new curriculum emphasizing cultural identity, autonomy, and belonging. This linked music, artisanal heritages, agri-food traditions, and so on. And so strengthened capacities for territorial defense and alternative development pathways, especially you now with the youth becoming a political cultural force. I mean, this is a story to be told about each of the communities, but there won't be time. So this will have to suffice. So next slide. Now, going back almost two decades, I mean, the tradition of communities gained some victories during the 2003 to 16 governments that were led by the Partido de Trabajadores, PTO Workers Party, but then in 2016, there was the judicial coup d'etat against President Dilma Rousseff, and then the right-wing parties gained a majority in parliament. So subsequent governments have weakened the previous gains or even tried to abolish them. There have been more threats to the traditional communities, and thus protests have intensified. This is one example. The dominant agenda has sought to change the ecological zoning of the northern coast with Real Noche to permit new construction by real estate companies. So move on, next slide. This shows you one of many protests. This is happened to be a Guarani, and in particular against the constitutional amendment, which would transfer the power more towards the federal government where the right-wing parties had greater influence. So the slogan says, guarantee our future. Yeah, next slide. Now, uh, more on this concept. The FCT initiatives extend Mutirao. This is a widespread rural culture of mutual aid and reciprocity. It's originally a Tupi Guarani term. Mutirao signifies a joint or cooperative effort. Nowadays, it denotes joint work in which all contribute and take terms for benefit in everyone. Utirao facilitates closer interpersonal contact, knowledge exchange, congenial work activity, and sometimes love relationships. Utirao has been maintained and extended through the music traditions. This will be illustrated by each community in turn. But before we go to each community, I'll just introduce some analytical concepts, which I'm calling counter-hegemonic concepts in the next two slides. And given the various harms from the dominant development model, critics blame modern thought for its colonizing role. And then these concepts are surveyed in a book collection of articles edited by Gallo, who leads the Observatorio and Nascimento, who you saw before giving the speech at the FCT event. So just a few of those concepts on which they draw. So one from Bonaventura de Sousa Santos, colonial zones continue today in modern Western thought, constituting the contemporary system of modernity. And then from Almeida, hom homogenizing colonialist attitudes, historically erased ethnic cultural diversities, diluting them in classifications, which emphasized the subordination of the natives, wild and illiterate, who lack the erudite knowledge of the colonizer. And then Santos, I say times two, but there's Milton Santos, the geographer in Brazil, and then Bonaventura de Souza Santos, so I think is based here. He's the dominant rural, and, and this is a critique of the dominant ideology you know, of the state and even most development excerpt, experts 
to promote so-called rural territorial development. And that's English translation. A, a concept which obscures these various conflicts about even the meaning of development, meaning of territory, on, on behalf of a, 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 a apparent consensus as the objective to be achieved. So they counterpose a territorialized development, which promotes socioeconomic equity and autonomy for traditional cultures. Now, the second one, uh, yeah, move on to the next slide. Then community is reconstituted by conserving and developing many cultural resources. Through reciprocity and mutual aid, traditional and musical cultures emphasize everyone's participatory experience and social interactions. This contrasts with dominant musical roles, especially in the West, as presentation or art for an audience. And I, I mentioned this concept because it is cited by some of the people who study these movements in Brazil. And then final point here from the uh, French geographer, Joao, that a collective sense of belonging depends on informal economies grounded in local social bonds. Such economies find a basis in places that generate composite cultures, social networks and belonging you know, in specific groups. The composite emphasizes perhaps a hybridization process between old and new and among traditional cultures, that, which thereby create something new. So move on, next slide. And the FCT perfectly illustrates that concept. So as I mentioned before, I mean, the PT-led governments had strengthened federal support for indigenous people. And we were looking here at the Guaranis, especially the Mbia language group of Guaranis, who are prevalent ones in this particular place, the Bopaina. But since 2016, the right-wing governments have attacked the earlier gains and the agencies who were responsible for providing those services or protections. So just as one example, perhaps the most important under federal law, indigenous people's lands were protected and were meant to be formally demarcated with a specific boundary. Yet the relevant agencies delayed decisions about granting legal title, thus weakening the state protection from profit-driven incursions. Well, next slide. Uh, yeah, the, uh, in Brazil, generally, the MBA language group of indigenous Guarani have maintained their emborai, which is a cultural form combining music and dance. Traditionally, they call their youths hondaraia, meaning male and female warriors. And originally, it, it had a military meaning you know, to res resist the colonizers by force of arms. And during the Portuguese empire in Brazil, and then other threats more recently. Nowadays, it's become a, a metaphor for conflicts with the state apparatus and colonizing agendas. This struggle needs different weapons than before, which are armas jurora, for example, paper, pen, legal arguments, and of course, dance, but also films of the sort that you'll be seeing here. The Yemborai feature the Hondara dance, where the youths imagine they are seeking and reaching the land without evils, and they learn to be warriors. It simulates movements of three birds, whereby dancers acquire strength, lightness, and agility. So we'll move on to the next. Now here we'll see a film where they're, they're always going to be singing in Guarani, but fortunately, uh, translations into Portuguese were provided. So in this case, it's como guerreros e guerreros to dance, sing, and celebrate our house of worship, that our ancestors gave us the Guarani way of life, to live and be Guarani. So if you could move to one minute and a half on that film. Yeah, just move the cursor. Uh, just for half a minute would be enough. Yeah. 
A gente tenta preservar mais é, So that's a, a performance group of sorts, but it's it's a community initiative that tries to bring in everybody's participation. So we'll move on next. Yeah, now here. So you'll see now just a, f a few of numerous protests that have escalated in the last few years. So this was to defend FUNAI, the, the National Indian Foundation which had performed important tasks you know, in collaboration with indigenous groups all over the country. And then the Bolsonaro government proposed to transfer it to the agriculture ministry, which of course has always supported the agribusiness interest. So in the town, it was Ubatuba, they occupied the central square and intersection and thereby blocked all the traffic. Yeah. Just show about a minute of this, and here they're doing. Police have difficulty removing them. Move on to the next one. Now. Uh, Les, when the video is on, can you speak up a bit? I think you okay. said, can you move on to the next one? But I'm also hearing the video sounds. So I can't hear you very well. Okay. Well, I mean, probably a half a minute on each one will be enough just to get the basic idea. Sure. So just a second. Let me go back to the yeah. presentation, share that. Yeah. And then and uh, in the next protest, the, uh, the, the uh, Special Secretariat for Indigenous Health well, that was now threatened with total abolition. So they escalated the protest. Now they occupied the intercity highway. Okay. And... Oh, sorry. What? <laughs> yeah, I don't know what that is. Yeah, we can skip the film. I'll just explain that the women held an, a, an enormous banner across the highway, you know, blocking at the traffic and sang their songs. And meanwhile, the men did the hondera. And on the next slide, you'll see just a still photo. Yeah, I mean, you saw the dance in the previous film. So they're doing this dance in the middle of the highway and the federal police are trying to move the protest, but have great difficulty doing so. Then, of course, this became national news because it's a major interway, uh, intercity highway. Now, the, the final one from the Guarani. Now, the government escalated its attack now on all the social services and pensions for everyone. And this is the, just one of many protests all over the country, but with a local angle. So they sang, we have power when we are all together, we sing this music to be happy. I mean, that's in Guarani, but the filmmaker sent, kindly sent me a translation. Should I put it on, Les? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Is that an advert? I don't know what, it, I mean, normally it would say, can't skip this, Les. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to edit it out this. <laughs> Sadly, <laughs> someone is that getting. Let me try this one. Is that the one, Les? That's it. Yeah. That's enough. Yeah. Okay. And, and then if you go back to the slide, it explains in English. Yeah, in fact, on the on the right hand side you saw Foro Bolsonaro. Bolsonaro. No, but, so the placard said, 
indigenous people are here in Paraty. It's one of those these towns I showed you before, from five villages. Demarcation now for indigenous land. Guarani people want indigenous help, meaning preserve Sasai. Take your dirty hands off my retirement. What shame, Paraty. You have flipped, but not schools on the coast. Flip is the, the International Literary Festival, which of course is attended by the wealthy elites. So they were denouncing the local authority uh, for using its funds to favor the wealthy groups rather than to establish Guarani schools. So I think we're ready for the next group now, Elon Bolas. So, so during the Portuguese empire, many slaves fled captivity went far away from the colonizers. They established communities and refuges, which were called quilombos, in remote forest areas, you know, to avoid capture. Hence today, their descendants are called quilombolas. In fact, they created the first democracy in Brazil, but that would be another story. So the 1988 constitution requires that the public authorities grant titles to all lands occupied by uh, quilombolas, but this requirement has been hardly implemented. As a rare exception, one settlement called the Campinho de Independencia did gain land title in 99. Afterwards, they gained resources to create a community-led development, initially a shared management of conservation areas, and then community-based tourism, you know, aiming to oppose the mass tourism that was dispossessing so many people. So we move on to the next slide. And the restaurant is a showcase and a, and a meeting point for that whole initiative, community-based tourism. It got uh, Rotero, an itinerary of, of the, the local agroforestry development and other sites of interest. And this is just the photo I took when we visited there, the, the kitchen and the women's room, the uh, you know, all the symbols, images. And I mean, just as a little sidelight, I was excited to see these tourist guidebooks of the sort I'd never seen before because they, and then I excitedly told uh, my, my colleagues from UNESCO and uh, they said, oh, of course, those were written by our PhD students. <laughs> we had come from these areas. So no, next slide. And Jongo is a dance with a song which is called Cantico or Ponto, song based on African forms, as you would expect, since that's where they were enslaved. That was sung by the slaves in plantation work and later in neighborhood cooperation activities, such as house building and harvest. And then the, the post-harvest festival would include often Kaisara and Quilombo songs. The Jongo plays many social roles in communal relationships, socialization of youth, and prophecy, which also has implications for action, so it's not merely waiting for better times. The lyrics assert an autonomous collective authority of the Quilombolas. These are just examples from two different canticos. I asked the queen of the sea for leave to save our people. That is recognizing a, a higher force rather than any official authority. Another one, at the edge of the sea, I saw a warrior who played the bugle. Like his entire army, he fights for me. So we'll move on, next slide. And through Yongo, the Kilimbolas sing and discuss the reconquest of land and of their freedom. That's written by a geographer. Youths can maintain their identity distant from the wounds the society has inflicted in the struggle for territory. Then in the last decade, of course, rap has become popular among youth throughout the world, especially Brazil, but mainly in urban areas. This particular area in the Bacayan is unusual as a rural area that has also now developed its own form of rap, whereby the roots make sense of their everyday experiences. The lyrics highlight territorial conflicts, question the economic system, denounce racism, praise the griot's wisdom, and honor the Quilombo's living culture. 
And just as an example from this area is Grupa Reali Daja Negra, Black Reality. So we'll just see a half a minute of it. I mean, it, it, it will sound perhaps similar to other rap. Slightly loath to stop there, Les. That was really yeah, fun. Well, there's wealth of material out there on the internet. I'm just giving you a little taste of it. And you saw the women singing in the back. I mean, I mean women have a leading role or prominent role in all these activities. I would need more time to explain that. So, I mean, like the other groups, I mean, their land is being further threatened by urbanization and certainly with state collusion at the federal level, sometimes local level. So they pursue their territorial claims through court procedures and protests. And all this gives an extra political significance to both Yongo and Rap. Your next slide. Now, third group, Caisares. So for several centuries, many of the early Portuguese immigrants lived on the coast, you know, far from the centers of the empire they integrated their customs, values, and capacities with other coastal groups, you know, including the Guarani, Guarani, and Quilombolos, you know, especially for fishing, which has become almost a stereotypical image of the Casares using their canoas, you know, uh, the same kind of canoes that existed centuries ago. Uh, one sociologist or, uh, described them as a marginal type of free peasant fisher inside a slave society. And that traditional way of life you know, continued after the end of slavery. The, as I mentioned before, in the 1970s, then the, the Costa Caisares were marginalized by development as modernization through luxury tourist resorts, condominiums, real estate speculation, and conservation areas. The, the, all these developments removed access to land that they had traditionally cultivated and thus weakened the basis for Mutira. Even worse, the potential income from tourism provoked competition among the Caisares, thus undermining their communal relations. And you'll see that in the songs, the lyrics that come later. So, and the musical culture is called Fandango, which was adapted from Portuguese traditional dance, the quadrille, which is well known throughout Europe and in the Caribbean. And it became associated more with Muti Rao in the Brazilian coastal context. And it meant that after a neighbor was helped with the harvest or house building, he would host a celebration, you know, organized cooperatively. Muti Rao now continues even after the, the celebrations have become detached from harvest, you know, given the, the weaker access to land for cultivation. There are many cultural initiatives, such as Projeto Cementis Casares, means Casares Seeds, a metaphor, which organizes workshops where youths learn how to play the music and to make the main interest, instrument, the Rebecca, which is a, a small version of a guitar, perhaps. And next slide. Now, there's a, a, it's called a circuito, this is a circuit, a series of Fandango Casara festivals and you just uh, see about a half a minute of this film to, to get a, a brief view of the dance and then matter of fact, it looks like you know, it's a good one.
Os encontros de fandango, ele, ele, ele acontece como forma de mutirão mesmo, né? A gente, é, cada, cada lugar se organizam dentro da sua realidade, do seu jeitinho, né? É, buscando apoios e é, parcerias. Não dá para contar muito com o poder público, infelizmente. É, nem todos os municípios, nem todas as festas têm apoio de poder público. Então, isso que é mais interessante. É a forma de como resiste através do mutirão. Não, não. Resistência mesmo. The English translation. É que a gente... Que, não, que teve município que não teve apoio. E a gente foi. Então, todo mundo... Is that enough, Les? Yeah, yeah. Now, back to the slides. So you can read in English what he was saying. See, ah, okay. A brief excerpt. I'm trying to understand. Yeah, so this, this is just my paraphrased translation of his long commentary in the film. The Fandango event is a form of mutirao, which is a form of resistance. Everyone helps the others. One person makes food, another helps to serve it, another brings a dishwasher, another puts up banners. The event ends up happening in this way. In the historical context of this people, doing the Fandango reminds you of the solidaristic labor of a collectivity where everyone participated, played, and benefited. Most important is bringing people closer to each other through Muzirao. All right, next slide. Now, this communitarian culture has been undermined by commercial tourism and the individualistic plunder of forests. And both these appear in, in the lyrics of some songs. So there's a sardonic song describes a tourist hotspot from which you know, the traditional people have been displaced. On Sad Wolf Street, where a shark lives, I mean, these are all, you know, animal metaphors for predation, and where tourists discover a paradise, yes, for them, but not for the people who were displaced. And another song laments the individualistic destruction of palm trees to extract the palm hearts and then illegally sell them. As the lyrics say, this purchase of palmito is worse than being a prisoner. Whoever cuts down the tree gains nothing, that is, gains hardly any money. Those who buy the palmito and then you know, sell it to companies make the money. It would be better to stop this trade. Song, sale of palmito. So the main target of such plunder was the Jusara tree, which is crucial for forest biodiversity. Its, it's fruit has many healthful benefits, So that provided an opportunity. In fact, you, you may know about the acai fruit, from the tree of that name, which, is, which was already widely sold and consumed in cafes and supermarkets. The Jusara has even more healthful benefits than the acai. So as a collective solution, the FCT initiated Projeto Jusara. And you can see, uh, how the harvest is done, the, the person climbing up that very tall tree on the left. So that's a skill in itself, but something more than that traditional skill was needed to create a new industry from the tray and protect the tray. So move on, next slide. So in 2012, the SCT established Projeto Jusara to protect the standing tray, deter plunder, and to valorize the health benefits. So Since then, cooperatives have been you know, selling the fruit pulp in shops. And to do that, they got technical assistance from an agroecological unit of Embrapa, the Brazilian Agricultural Research Agency, which, which mainly serves agribusiness, but has some units which serve these kinds of initiatives. And The, uh, the fruit could then be produced all year round on a much larger scale than would have been po possible without that technical advice. So it's been generating income for the, the people who manage now the protected forests, and likewise income for businesses that process the pulp into food products. Moreover, they popularize recipes for making various tasty products from the pulp. There's a whole you know, recipe book. 
and they hold an annual Jusara festival, bringing together the communities with their musical cultures. So next slide now, and we move to the conclusion in three parts. So to recapitulate, the Bacana subregion exemplifies many coastal areas where traditional communities face threats from development as modernization, which has been colonizing their everyday lives, for example, degrading their natural resource base, expanding real estate interests, and shifting their production consumption patterns towards a profit-driven economy. In response, intercommunity activities have redefined collective identities while politically transforming tradition for solidaristic relationships in old and new forms. These strategies have drawn on counter-hegemonic concepts from Brazilian writers who develop those concepts you know, in engagement with the resistance of such groups. Cooperative activities build a territorialized development, meaning that they aim to transform the mode of production for greater socioeconomic equity. Now, next, under the motto of Justice Socioambiental, that is socio-environmental justice, the FCT has brought together the three traditional groups through joint activities. They all maintain their musical traditions grounded in dance. The mus lyrics have metaphorical, ironic, sardonic, and elusive forms, They're referring to the problems that they face and their aspirations for a better life. These traditions help to maintain and extend Mutirao, which has been traditionally central to their agri food systems. Community bonds have been mobilized to defend their state services, natural resources, and territory. Likewise, to create alternative development pathways based on agroecological agroforestry. In, in these ways, an ethno social diversity complements agri biodiversity, as exemplified by the new Jusara agri food culture. I mean, that concept comes from another Latin American theorist, and if he left. Now, final slide. So, through uh, our email exchanges between Andrew and uh, Angela Impey in the music department in the last couple of weeks, somehow there emerged this concept, decolonial resistance conservation. So thanks to you both. So th this uh, gives an extra twist on the, the motto of the FCT, to conserve is to resist. The intercommunity solidarity helps to counter the prevalent modernization and to create novel alternatives agroforestry, ethnically differentiated education, community-based tourism, public festival, and so on. In these ways, musical and agri-food cultures have been mobilized, gaining a new significance as a resource for alternative development. Diverse traditions converge into composite cultures, thereby deepening the social basis of territorial belonging. So I conclude there, except after the discussion, we could have a song. That's on the final slide, but we can leave that. For so, sorry, is this the final slide, Les, or should I move yes, on? Except, except for the one with the song, which we can um, save till after the discussion. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that, Les. Uh, I found that really fascinating and uh, kind of mind blowing. Uh, I really enjoyed it, even though I was still trying to <laughs> juggle with the screens and the sounds and all the rest of it. Um, so, uh, and now let's kind of open it up to the uh, to, to everyone. I'll leave these slides in the background, but what I'm what I'd like to do is um, mainly gather questions that people actually say to Les. You can also put them in the chat if you would like to. But for those who are game, I'd very much like to sort of have a physical conversation if you like. And what I'm suggesting by way of organizing that is that if people put their hands up, they literally raise their hands in the in the little <laughs> there's a little button at the bottom you can press, which is raise hands. Um, is that there for you guys? I think that there's a raise hand facility at the bottom. There is, okay, because I'm just not seeing it on my screen. So I was a bit worried about that. Okay, so oh. if you can raise your hand that I can sort of basically um, organize uh, the list of questions and uh, you know, and just sort of do it on a first come, first serve basis. Because uh, I think I yeah, can you, now you can stop the share screen as well. Yeah. Okay. I'll stop the share. Yeah. Because we can always come back to that slide to the song. Sure. Okay. So, um, 
Right. So oh, maybe I'll do that afterwards. So who would like to, to kick us off with a question for Les then? If you just put your hand up, I will see it in the list of participants and I'll we can shoot to you. So we've got a question from uh, Anna, if you'd like to come on and if you feel like turning your video on, we'd, we'd love to see you as well. Hi there, thank you so much. That was really interesting. It's not an area I know much about. So um, that was just fascinating. And um, I'd like to, I, I was wondering if you could say a bit more about what the, um, what the biggest challenges have been of working, um, like communicating across three different um, community groups. So sort of taking what's, um, you know, the three different sort of cultures and three different traditions and, um, you know, forging something new that's kind of a three community identity in one. Um, and what, what were the biggest struggles in doing that? Yes, well, that's a crucial question for which I may not have a very strong answer because I haven't been at that interface, so to speak. I'm doing this from a distance and dealing with the, uh, the observatorio and the FCT and distance, you know, especially, I should mention that we had an elaborate plan to do participatory action research with all those communities and in other parts, other case studies in Brazil, we were all ready to go with that detailed plan in February. And then came the pandemic and we had to cancel all our plans. And now we're just trying to do as much as we can online. But uh, from what I know and what I've read, I mean, a major problem was the one I mentioned before, this, uh, all these financial pressures and land pressures created a, a competitive mentality within each group and um, even more so perhaps among the groups. So how to overcome competitive, I mean, even individualistic mentality. So all these alternatives, development agendas and intercultural sharing that were means of overcoming that competitive mentality. You know, so that I suppose, especially around the concept of resources, people think of resources as scarce, but they're made scarce by the profit-driven activities when people have a wealth of resources. In fact, this, you know, this came up in one of the many webinars that either we organized or the, the, the other groups organized with some of the speakers from the traditional communities are saying, we have all these resources available to us, and especially in the nearby forests, or some of them live literally in the forest, how to make the most of those resources rather than think of resources as something that depend on money but coming from somewhere else. Mm. Sure. So um, I have a similar question that Les, but I'm going to switch to one in the chat first, um, which is, uh, so I have difficulty scrolling through the chat thing. Paul Francois, um, I have a question for Les about religion. What is the role of indigenous religion in mobilizing communities and resistance, but also the role of perhaps Pentecostal groups in anti-indigenous discourse? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, I've read a little ethnography about the Guarani religion and all their songs refer to the house of worship, which has more, communal meanings perhaps than you might associate with worship as if they were a priest, you know, leading a ceremony and reading the scripture. The worship is always a, a communal activity. So we could, the word, I mean, it was in this song that I translated. We could give the wrong impression about what the religion means. It, it bears little resemblance to like Western institutionalized religions. But it's all about asserting, re renewing communal bonds among the people so that everyone is, is included and is made to, to feel that they belong to that community. 
Mm -hmm. <clears throat> maybe I'd leave it at that because I'm I'm no expert. I'm now reading more about religion and what do they mean by the house of worship. Mm. Yeah, the Pentecostal um, churches have been a big threat to all the progressive gains of the last several decades. And they've been expanding substantially, you know, with initially with finance from their supporters in Western countries, especially in North America, you know, promoting a totally individualistic mentality, promoting the idea of you know, individual salvation through a combination of greed and and uh, future success through your own efforts. And these, these churches have been proliferating all over the country, including in these traditional areas. And have attracted, I think, some people from Quilombo and Kaisara communities. I don't know to what extent. I mean, probably not from Guarani, but that would, it would be a little more difficult for them to, to totally fragment that, that, the, the communal bonds. So, yes, a serious threat. Mm. And I. I don't know what what are the counter strategies, so to speak, except to create these communal intercommunity alternatives that would be more attractive to people as as a collective identity and as a better future. Mm. Tends to ask another question there, Les, but I'm going to wait and let Maudie uh, come in uh, first. Maudie, what is your question? Hi, thank you, Les, for that talk. That was very interesting. Um, I have a couple of questions. Firstly, um, I know over the last few decades, obviously, there's been a big push to protect and re, um, reforest the Mata Atlantica down the, the coast of, um, of Brazil in the, the crossing through the Bocaina region that we're talking about. Um, and I wonder whether there is whether those two projects um, have kind of mutually supported each other, whether the, the conservation project of the Mata Atlantica has, has contributed to, to helping the, um, this, this movement or, and, and, and vice versa. And secondly, whether there's any similar form of community um, elsewhere in the country, especially up in the Northeast, where there's a much higher concentration of Quilombolis um, and, and indigenous groups. Yes, I think that going back to the shared management initiative, I mean, that demand then eventually created a turning point and reshaped the meaning of conservation because it was going to mean that this myth of untouched nature by the local people or people who even lived in the forest were seen as an inherent threat who had to be removed. So reforestation could have meant professional foresters and perhaps companies taking over and perhaps even for, for commercial gain, it was unclear. And certainly the, the management was being privatized. So then the state bodies weren't even going to be politically Know, publicly accountable for how it was done. And that was part of the overall you know, privatization agenda. But the demand for shared management, including the traditional communities prevailed in some places, including this one. And that meant that the reforestation you know, essentially involved them so that they could do the reforestation in a way that both conserve the resources and improve their incomes. And then eventually you know, enhance their public visibility through uh, community-based tourism. So I, I don't know to what extent that has prevailed in other analogous places in the country. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm, good question. Um, we've we've had another um, just to come back quickly to to the follow up from Paul Francois in relation to the the issue about um, 
the the Pentecostal uh, churches, uh, comparing the two very different ontologies uh, of transcendence. One, a community of living, dead, and non-humans. I take it that's the kind of you know the, the indigenous kind of one, and then the one individualistic, materialistic, driven by the prosperity um, gospel. And a comment on that. Yes, one new movement that is trying to bridge those communities is the Universal Church in Brazil, seemingly drawing on tradition and including all beliefs, including ancestors, but not allowing drums and traditional music. <laughs> right. <laughs> OK, <clears throat> so no asymmetrical power relations there in relation to what <laughs> is drawn into syncretism. But um, just can I very quick, quickly chip in here as well, Les? I've done some uh, research in northwest Argentina, right on the border border with Bolivia, indeed in a part of Argentina that used to be um, Bolivia, and um, in, a, in a place where um, people didn't want to be Argentine, and over time the word Boliviano has actually become a dirty word in some sort of context, and there are all kinds of interesting identity questions and dynamics going on there. So, and this is to, to, to pitch this in one of the identities there is or one of the the, the 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 groups that has survived with some level of sort of um you know kind of uh, continuity over time is the chili one or they're a very small group of people and they are in a protected area uh, uh, in a barito national park in a very tiny place called uh, libeo and they don't talk much about publicly about that identity because there isn't the kind of space to celebrate still because the dominant identity even in the north and the northwest of Argentina which is ethnically very diverse the dominant identity has been criollo which has been which is um, descended from um, his, his the Spanish and the Europeans who came over um, and there's slowly more room to peek out from this but the Chiriwano people partly because of the repression they faced from the conservation authorities in Argentina, like having their villages burned down, the village burned down, um, and huge, you know, uh, types of, of, uh, of, of uh, intimidation, which, you know, have changed since they got a more humane kind of uh, a park ranger who, who's in charge of the park now. But they also... Um, They've really seen the entrance of the of the Pentecostal Church, and in some ways, it's it, it's it is you know kind of strange and problematic, and it, it does change a lot of you know the kind of you know the the fabric of life for them. You know, there are, there are parallels of festivals and rituals and and uh, communal events which are no longer kind of encouraged, but at the same time, what the Pent the arrival of Pentecostalists has done is um actually addressed the problem of alcoholism that was really rife in in the in the you know as well and and it's it raises that you know it's it's not all bad i guess is what i'm saying even though it's deeply problematic in the ways that the uh you know the the, the questions in our, in our chat have sort of brought up um but i'm i'm wondering how how you see that in the well let me say so here's my question for you les um <clears throat> in going back to Anna's question at the start of how these groups actually get on is there a sense in which one of these identities identity groups takes itself to be in a you know top of the kind of the power hierarchy so to speak and, and things like that which have to be negotiated in the way of say the Criollo, Chiriwano, um, Boliviano um, and um, Quechua identities that you find um, in in northwest Argentina, where like the the people who fight, see themselves as Criollo, even though they're ethnically much more mixed than than that and that, that word and that characterization would lead you to believe, they are at the top of a pecking order. Albeit, you know, they're all kind of subaltern at some level. But how do those kind of dynamics work out between these three groups? Well, <clears throat> from what I know, I mean. None of them were privileged by the dominant system. I mean, none of them had the prospect of being incorporated in some kind of power relationship with the other. It was more like a rivalry for resources and access to land among them or even within them, within each one. That's my understanding. So perhaps it may not be analogous to some other places where there is that neo-colonial strategy to use one group against another. So that's just from what little I know at this stage. 
So I think the perhaps that's why it was more feasible in such a place to create bonds among them by sharing their cultures, which are both you know, cultures of community and of resistance in the context I described. I mean, that's just my intuition. That would be much more difficult in uh, a place where one group is being instrumentalized against the others or, or made to feel superior by the uh, colonial agenda. Mm. Sure. Yeah, it's a, it is a different context in, in some ways, but I, I'm guessing that, yeah, it can't be easy to manage the differences as well as the similarities between those groups. Um, OK, so do we uh, so we have one more quest comment about. Uh, oh, sorry, we've, we've had that one. Um, so, oh, is there another question here? Looks like there might be. How have the dynamics shifted since 2016? What pressures have the right wing government introduced and has this changed the strategies or practices of the FCT? Well, there have been more and more threats, even to the existence of some federal agencies. And that applies to say all small scale producers, like abolishing a whole ministry that had been promoting policies and support measures for small scale, especially agroecological producers. So from what I know, they've had to support resistance and support for that resistance among all the communities and beyond the traditional communities in order to prevail. And at the same time, perhaps there are more opportunities for such broader support because whole social sectors have been fighting against those right-wing governments on several fronts at once. So I suppose in a sense, when they launched the campaign in 2014, I mean, that was still under the PT government. That set the ground set a stronger basis for the uh, even greater difficulties that were to come after 2016. And you know, I left out many details, such as a, a broad range of organizations that supported that campaign from the start, and now even, an even broader range, and that, and that sometimes join in the protests. And it, it means that with less of the state support measures available, or even uh, state attacks, they become more dependent on their own resources in the broad sense to, to make the most of their own collective capacities and to, to use the natural resources to which they have access. And, and in particular, I mean, uh, the observatorial is a project funded by the health ministry at the federal level and somehow has been protected from these drastic cuts or even abolition of many programs which have been supporting these initiatives. So that has made an, an important difference. So it's perhaps behind the scenes and necessary to protect that program. Mm. Yeah. I mean, all these questions I would like to investigate more, but we'll have to do that by online means. <laughs> to be able to As the uh, pandemic you know, seems to be getting worse. It does, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And um, do you have a sense of of that, Les, of, of the, the ways in which uh, you know, there's been there has been coverage, hasn't there, about uh, in the news about how the Bolsonaro government has seemingly kind of deliberately not really helped um, indigenous communities across Brazil. Have you have you seen any of the repercussions of that in relation to these three communities? Yes, I mean, at one level, of course, everybody has been suffering unnecessarily because the, the federal government didn't do what they should have done, as you might say the same thing here and in the USA in particular. 
know, alongside the increasing attacks on the progressive gains of the, the PT government. For this particular area, the Burkina, the communities themselves decided, this, when they saw the danger signs, they would just close off access to their specific areas where they live. Mm. That meant stopping the tourism, stopping any trade, and instead relying on donations of, of food beyond what they could produce themselves. And that was coordinated partly by the observatorio. And then to increase exchanges among those traditional communities. So if, if they have surplus of fish in one place or surplus of maize in another place, then they do swaps. And so they've increased their solidaristic activity among themselves while stopping pretty much all commerce in the financial sense to to ensure that the virus doesn't reach them. Yeah. And um, are they having, maybe you don't know this, but are they having discussions? I don't know whether what the vaccination program is looking like in Brazil right now. Are there discussions? Are there, is, is there a trust kind of question around, around, you know, whether to have the vaccine about the sort of relations it brings them into with the state authorities is there a mobilization which is looking to get vaccines i mean i don't know maybe it's a bit too early to ask these questions Les, but i mean there it's called negacionismo like denialism would be the nearest english word and of course that's a global phenomenon and much more widespread than i would have imagined in places that i wouldn't imagine but as far as I know, in those particular communities, they have the opposite problem that they want it and can't easily get it mm. for the, the reasons of conflicts within the government over whether whether vaccines are needed at all. And that's another whole story. You know, whether this really is a, a, a fatal disease. <laughs> <laughs> and then the health ministry and some state governments wanting to promote the vaccine, but in conflict with the federal government. That, that would be a different talk. But you know, as far as I know, these communities know that they need it, but can't easily obtain it. Yeah, yeah, that sounds um, that sounds very tough. And uh, sorry, I could ask loads more questions. I won't because. I'd like to do two things. One is I'd like to leave a chance for any final questions that anyone might have. So are there any other questions that we want to ask, speak now or forever hold your peace? And we could finish with a song. Well, that's what I was hoping for as well. So if we go back to the, just the final slide, which gives you the link yeah, well, it has a little description of the songwriter and then the link to the bilingual lyrics. Sure. So uh, just before you go, everyone, I know some people are dropping out because they need to go to lectures or whatever. We're going to try and uh, let me go back to the uh, to the presentation and I'll try and find the link in the final slide. Did you say? Yes. Yeah. OK, just a second. Uh, I need to get this stuff off my screen so I can see what I'm doing. So, uh, hang on. I thought this was the final. Oh, yeah. Sorry, you said there's one. So, yeah. one here. Okay. Well, All right. The Song of Three Races, written by Paolo Cesar Pinheiro, who has white, native, and African ancestry, all three races. Right. And he says the song was born out of that interbreeding of the three races from the strong nostalgia of the white colonizer the fatal fear the black man felt by being away from his land and from the native land suffering. Yeah, and the, uh, this gives you both the languages. And the, the chorus is fairly simple melody with, without words. So you should be able to follow it fairly easy. But remember, turn off your 
microphones because the internet has a time delay which prevents simultaneous or synchronized music making from different computers regardless of where they are. So if you move back to the, I think, no, no, I'm, we're going to sing it. Yeah, we don't sure. need, I mean, I'm going to sing it and you can. Join in. Yeah. I mean, I okay, so what, am I putting the lyrics on the screen then, Les? Is that what you want? Just the lyrics as they are. Sure, right. So I'll start with the chorus, which then comes up another two times. Okay. So just try it, but mute it, everybody. So looks on the door, no canto do Brazil. Un lamento triste sempre echo. Desde que yo indio guerrero, for cativero e de la canto. Negro ento. Un canto de revolto para los ares, no quilombo dos palmares, donde se refugió. For a luta dos equivalentes, pela quebra das correntes, na de anteo, e de guerra em paz, de paz em guerra, todo o povo dessa terra, quando é potente que andar, cantar de dor. Oh, 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 Noite e dia, e em sua descedor, ai, mas que agonia, o canto do trabalhador, esse canto que devia ser um canto de alegria, só apenas como um soluçar de dor. No canto do Brasil. Un lamento triste sempre ecoó. Desde que o indio guerreiro foi que tiveiro e de lá canto. Negro ento. Un canto de revolto pelos ares. No quilombo dos palmares. Onde se refugió. For a luto des evidentes. Pela quebra das correntes. Na de ante yo, e de guerra en paz, en paz, paz en guerra, todo pozo de cetero, cuando hay pote cantar, cantar de dor. Oh, 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 oh
um, in some way, shape or form, either via links or I might try and get this onto the SOAS YouTube channel, if that's okay with you, Les. Yes, if you can possibly remove those bits of films that weren't meant to be, if it's possible. <laughs> I'll see what I can do, Les. I don't know. I don't know if you can. Well, I don't know how to edit um, mm. the uh, what do you call it the 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 video itself. But I'll, I'll see what I can do. See if one of our technical people can do that. But thank you very much, Les. Thank you everyone for thank coming. Um, I think we'll call it a day there and keep within our sort of allotted time. Um, and as I say, uh, I'll post the recording so that anyone who wants to revisit any of, of this or you know use it as notes or whatever will be able to see it. Um, uh, enjoy the rest of your days and hopefully you can go um, <clears throat> singing and thinking uh, about the, uh, the, the Canto das Tres Razas. All right, thanks to everybody. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. Okay.